excited about about Jesus more than I ever have been before. Um, I'm excited about Jesus being alive in me. The difference between Christianity and everything else is the fact that no other uh, people or no other um, um, opportunity is there where uh, the person that you're worshiping is living in you. And there's no other one that has been created all things and is the sum total of everything that exists. And there's no other one who has risen from the dead and is alive. Um, the Hindus don't have a risen God. Uh, Muhammad is dead and in the ground. Um, all the other paganism and all the other kind of, uh, of occults and everything do not offer anything except for dead. Uh, the Bible talks about not talking to the dead. You see shows now on the TV, people talking to the dead. Why would you talk to the dead when you can talk to your living creator? I just got that question. I was like, why do people want to talk to some dead person? I want to talk to the living God, not some dead funky demon speaking to somebody. Uh, so, you know, when we're, when we're talking about Easter, a few things come to my mind. Christianity being so much more um, um, powerful than anything else because of the living Christ in you. He's in you. And, and, and Easter being powerful with the living Christ and understanding that Christ is living in us of the fact that we, we minister and we do things for God not because we're trying to earn something. We minister and we serve God because of a position of where we already are. Religions of the world are, are walking out of a place of weakness. If I really try and I really focus, maybe I can be reincarnate, reincarnated as a, as a, um, you know, a, as a cockroach. <laughs> because after all, cockroaches and McJagger are going to be the only thing that's alive if a nuclear war hits. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, you know, I mean, come on. You're trying to focus your energy to come to a certain path of enlightenment. And here in Jesus... He did the work, and He is the light, and we are walking in His light. And so that's why in Christianity it's different than any other thing in the entire world, because all other religions are trying to do things. If you can only be good enough, if you walk, if you do this path, then you might reach some level of this, that, or the other. And Jesus is saying, I did the work, receive me. And you will walk in light. You're a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things come to you. The cool thing about our God and the cool thing about the gospel is He did the work. You don't have to do it. That's the difference. And so you're walking out of a place of victory. You're walking out of a place of identity. You see, last Easter I preached a message about Paul standing up out of Romans 8.13 and he stood up and he waved his hands, you know. And he says, He's risen! Christ is alive! And um, the, uh, the, the, the bonus that you have is the fact that you don't have to do the work. God does the work. That's awesome. It's a work of His grace and mercy. I messed up. I went my own way. I did my own thing. But God said, I love Barry. I trust Him. I want Him. I want Him to trust me. I love Him. I want Him to love me. And so I'm going to shed blood because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And it's my shedding of blood. And he kept this plan from the devil. And it says in 1 Corinthians there that if Satan would have known about this plan, that he wouldn't have crucified, that the, the powers of darkness wouldn't have crucified Jesus. And Jesus was not crucified. He laid his own life down. He wasn't killed. He laid it down. He was not murdered. He gave it up. He said, I could have called a legion of angels. It wasn't something that... that um, uh, they took from him. He willingly gave it for you and I. He willingly left heaven for you and I. Um, it was it was a gift. Um, so you know, Wednesday night, I sure we preached on finances, and what what a meeting it was. I wasn't here, but my goodness, what a meeting that was. I got a bunch of calls saying, "Hey, listen, this was powerful. This was it was it was awesome." And so I said, "Praise the Lord." And um, sure we had not ministered and finished. Um, some of the things that he was going to share on finances, and I wanted to, to bring those forth. And I know it's not really an Easter message, but there's this there's a wrong spirit in um, the church that has been in the past that people thought it was holy to be poor. Somehow you're humble if you're poor, or you're holy, or you're righteous if you're poor. And that's not it at all. Um, you're not holy or righteous if you're poor, or you're in poverty. 
there's great men and women of God that have done great things of God that have had the wrong idea about money. They've had the totally wrong idea about money. Um, and so um, I wanted to just, I wanted to minister tonight and, and open your guys' eyes and hopefully get into your heart because I'm not here, I don't want to teach you to people's heads. I want the Lord to reach your heart and the very person that you are to be changed. And when you leave out of here, something deposited in you that will uh, be uh, fruit that will grow for eternity. Amen. Something more than just something you're receiving here. But here, some change broken, some ideas maybe that you th thought about yourself. And, and um, you know, the emotions are, are an interesting place. They really are. And, and uh, the emotions are, are an intriguing place. The soul of a person, the mind, the will, the intellect, the emotions. Um, you know, uh, many people are caught up with alcohol and drugs and different things because of abuse that has happened. And you've got a Vietnam vet who's trying to forget about the past, so he buries himself in alcohol, trying to forget about the past. No one has ever told him about Jesus or the healing power of God to go in and pull all that out of his emotions. The soul is an, it is an interesting place. And people think that truth is influential. Truth is not influential. Hitler said if you say a lie loud enough and long enough, people will believe it. You know what influences a person? I'm going to tell you what influences a person is repetition. Repetition will influence you. When we wrestled and we did wrestling camps and training with Dan Russell and some of the world's greats, some of the gold medalists, we used to repeat repetition, 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 repetition. Why? So if you were in a certain move, you wouldn't even have to think about it. You could just, boom, you could just do it. You can feel this other guy trying to put an arm bar on you, boom, you spin, bop, boom, you know, do all those cheap moves, grab by his chin and twist it, cut off his throat, you know, all that stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Um, when you do an arm bar, so when you do a cross face, I always said, you know, cross face them real, real hard. You know, that way their head's spinning and it disorients them. And uh, there was a local guy, a uh, USC fighter, um, what's his name, local guy that was training down here? Um, um, Randy Couture. He used to be a wrestling coach. One of the guys he was wrestling, he did a cross face on him so hard he broke his nose. And the guy was crying. But if you want to be a champion, you've got to perform and execute, you know. Um, the thing is, is that, you know, with, um, with, with the things of God, it's got to be repetition. You say, man, why should be talking about confession so that you start doing it? It doesn't matter if he teaches three times on confession and you understand it. That does not matter. The only time that this message on confession is going to be for you when you start doing it. Jeff said to me this week, he goes, man, after hearing for a year about confession, and after teaching these meetings on Gary Carpenter, and hearing Sherby, and some of, some of the teachings, he goes, I'm now understanding the importance of my mouth in the idle time. Now, he's going to see things changing, because it was not until he started doing it that you're really going to receive uh, from this. So, a little girl um, um, is out there in summertime, and, and uh, uh, the ice cream comes by, and... Um, she, she, the, the, um, she runs in and says, Mom, can I have some money for ice cream truck? And the mom says, no, there's no money for the ice cream truck. And so the next day the ice cream truck comes by. Mom, can I have some money for the ice cream truck? No, there's no money for the ice cream truck. Dad has all the money. Next day, Mom, can I have my money for the ice cream? We don't have any money. We're broke. We're not going to have any money. And uh, Dad's the one that keeps all the money. So pretty soon, emotionally, this little girl thinks men are the only ones that have money. Women aren't supposed to have money. Why am I saying this? Because I'm saying that there's signals and triggers that happen to people at an early age. Their soul starts to think things without it being said. And these lies start coming and you get negativity and things that aren't the truth on a proportion that is very high when you're young if you don't have the Word of God coming. And so, you know, talking about money and talking about these financial things, um, it's important. It's important because of the fact that that um, it, it takes, um, it takes the, the truth of God's Word to set us free and get us on, on the right page. Um, and so I wanted to just turn to Deuteronomy 8.18, if you would. I want to turn there tonight. I want, you to, um, I want you to understand that your focus is not to be on money, it's to be on Jesus. But there's been some, some wrong mindsets. It grieves my spirit when I go to different ministries and all you hear about is, is money, 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 and you don't hear about Jesus. 
It grieves my spirit when you, you see some ministries that are not focusing on Christ and on the things of Christ. But it also grieves my spirit when I see some Christians living in poverty and thinking that's where God wants to keep them. And thinking that, you know, some people have a wrong mindset of money over here. Some people have a wrong side, side of money of being thinking it's good to be poor. And the narrow road is in the middle. You know, there's, there's lies and errors on, on every side. The truth is very narrow. And, um, you know, when it comes to the gospel, money can control you. If God tells you to do something and you don't step out and do it because of money, now money's controlled you. And you're wrong. You need to step out there and say, God, I'll do it because I believe you and I trust you and I know that you can do the miraculous. And then there's money that controls people where people can, they're, they're serving money. God tells them to go do this over here, but they think, well, I got a good job offer over here. I'm going to take it. And I'm not saying it's wrong to take a job offer. If God doesn't tell you to do something, you got a good opportunity. But many Americans and young Americans, 18 to 20 year olds, are serving and seeking money. Where's the money? What's happening with the money? And, um, I'm not saying it's a wrong thing to make good business decisions and, and use your talents the best way you need to. But where is the asking of God what God wants for their life? Maybe, you know, nine out of ten kids, maybe three of them are supposed to, you know, be missionaries. And these other three, God's called them to business, to make money. But every one of them needs to be focusing on Jesus and putting Jesus first and say, Lord, where do I fit in this thing? How, do, how can I serve you? What can I do? I know some women and some people around the world. They're engineers in other countries. They make in their country what would be compared to this country like over 100000 a year. And they live in a one-bedroom apartment, ride a bike to work, and the rest of their money goes solely to supporting the work of the gospel. They say our goal and our mission is for funding the gospel. That's what God's called us to. Amen. That's a ministry. In itself, it's a ministry. In Deuteronomy 8.18, it says here... Um, it says, Then you say in your heart, My power and my might and my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers, as it is in this day. And God gives you the power to get, get wealth. Okay? Now let me ask you this question. Do you think that God decides who's wealthy and who's not? No. Yeah. No, He doesn't. But God gives you the power to get wealth. It says in the Bible that when God gives you wealth, He has no sorrow with it. it. says in the Bible that you shouldn't work hard to be rich. Because I, I'm going to tell you something. I want to spur some of you guys tonight to get out of the idea of living below what God has gifted you and given you. Some of you guys have ideas. Some of you guys have um, ingenuity. Some of you guys have been gifted uh, something from God and business ideas. Oral Roberts says that God gives ideas, concepts, and opportunities. That's what Oral Roberts said. And, and some of you guys have been given these things, but here's the problem. Sometimes the church just waits on God to do something, and really they're supposed to go out and do it. It says that God gives you the power to get wealth. Okay? But God's not deciding who's wealthy and who's not, because if God is deciding who's wealthy and who's not, why would the mafia have all the money? But they're a little more diligent about going out and running their cocaine dealings. And the, and the Christians, well, I'm just waiting on God. I'm just waiting on God. Well, in His Word, didn't He say He gives you the power to get wealth? And you've got a calling in business? Why aren't you taking some classes on business? Why aren't you getting around business people who make a lot of money to pick their brains and, and, and to ask questions and go out and do real estate deals? How come you're sitting on your hands? Well, I'm just waiting on God. I'm waiting on God. Sixty years later, we're coming. I'm waiting on God. Well, what are you waiting on? You know? God's not sitting there. He's given you the word. He's given you, he's given you the, 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 the tools. So let's turn to, um, I want to turn to Psalms. And, and here's the thing. When you see what the Lord has, has, has in store for you, sometimes, you know, when you um, see um, all the opportunity that is there, Psalms 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold to those who walk uprightly. It says no good thing will He withhold to those who walk uprightly. See, our focus, guys, our focus has to be on Jesus. But I want to shake you guys out of this mindset that God um, desires for you to be poor or live in poverty. The Bible says that you would prosper and be in soul even as you, prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God says that He gives wealth and riches to establish His covenant on the earth. 
God says, let's just turn there, 1 Corinthians 8.8. 8. I want you to see this uh, tonight. I want, I want you to see um, what it is that God has in store for you. 1 Corinthians 8.8. 8. Somebody can read that scripture. Be, uh, food will not affect our relationship with God. We are no worse off if we eat that food and no better off if we don't. Keep reading. But be careful that by using your freedom you don't somehow make a believer who is weak in faith fall into sin. For example, suppose someone is weak, conscious sees you, who have this knowledge of eating in the temple of a false god. Okay, I'm sorry. I was um, in the wrong place. I was yeah. supposed to be reading 2 Corinthians 8.8. 2 Corinthians 8.8. Someone uh, get that. Um, go ahead and read that first. Steve's got a little cheat in there because he's got those tabs in his Bible. So he can find it faster than everybody else. He was the kind, he was the kid that got all the kid candy in um, in uh, Sunday school, you know. <laughs> yeah. I am not command, I got it. Okay, okay, go ahead. I am not commanding you. <laughs> I am not commanding you. But I want to test the sincerity of your love by, by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, <coughs> that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So that you, through his poverty, might be might become might Amen. become rich. Amen. Amen. See, Jesus, Jesus took your guys' sin, right? So you don't have to walk in it. He says, "I'm a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new." Because Jesus is is dead and, 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 and risen, we're crucified with Christ. Galatians two twenty. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live not I, but Christ lives in me. Amen. I, Christ lives in me. So Jesus died and said he took your poverty and he took your sin. So why, why would somebody think that if Jesus became poor, that through his poverty we might be made rich? And he's not talking about spiritual poverty here, even though he did take our spiritual poverty, right? He took many things. If you look at Isaiah 52 or 53, read Isaiah 53 or 52 later, later on tonight, and look at everything that Jesus went through and became. Everything that he bore on the cross for us to turn around and give us um, his righteousness. Um, it says he became poor that through his poverty I might be made rich. Man, that's good stuff. I, and, and, here, and here it is that um, I know this couple who was going to church down in Albany, Oregon. And they needed money to go to that church. They felt they were called to the church, but they were living on a limited income. And they only had X amount of dollars. They didn't have the money for gas. And so what happened was, is they started driving their car and they were praying, Lord, you know, help us with the finances. Lord, we just lift this, this, uh, this need to you. And you know what God did for them? He made it to where their gas stayed at three quarters of the tank for like a year and a half. Never did they fill that car up. Okay? But the thing is, is that your faith can do that kind of stuff. But your faith can also get you through and have endurance at a minimum wage job. Not to knock a minimum wage job. Not to knock any job. Not to knock it at all. But I'm trying to tell you guys tonight that if God's given you gifts, and God's given you talents, and God's given you abilities, ask the Lord, what have you put in me? What gift have you put in me so that I might uh, benefit people around me in the church? What ideas? What things have you put in me? And, uh, what talents? And how can I utilize that to the best of my ability? You know, Andre Crouch, when he was a young man, he had uh, the gift of music. Andre Crouch was probably the best gospel singer ever. <coughs> his dad said, Lord, if I'm, he says, I'll be a preacher, God. He goes, I'll leave business and I'll go be preach. You know, I know that you're calling me. But he says, God, you know how I love music. And so, God, if I'm going to be a minister, I want you to give my son the gift of music. And he gave him the gift of music. And man, was he gifted. The music he wrote. I mean, when he was up here hanging out with, at uh, the church service, one time the pastor was preaching at the, between. Between the time that the church ever started and the end, he wrote a song with all the lyrics, all the backup and everything. The first song he ever wrote was, uh, The Blood Will Never Lose Its Power. And, and um, that gift was in him. And, and you know what? Um, uh, Pastor Larry Reed prophesied to him and said, Look, man, out of, out of, out of John, God's going to give you a song about the glory. And it was out of the, the book, I think it was the book of John. And the next day he wrote that song, To God. 
be the glory. Anyway, so he came up with that song, the tribute, and that gift was in him. And they said, and, and there was a prophecy that came forth, Andre, you're not going to have to go to the world, but the world's going to come to you. So Michael Jackson was putting his song together, The Man in the Mirror. And um, he said, Andre, you've got such a gift. Can you help me to compose this thing? Can you help me get down with this thing? And Andre's like, yeah, man, we can do it. And he sits down and he helps him out with some stuff. And um, after he did that, he started playing one of his songs about the blood. And there was 20 people, 30 people of Hollywood's best sitting there in tears going, what is this? What's going on? What is this thing that's on us? He says, it's Jesus. And Michael Jackson's like, I've never heard or seen anything like this. Your music has a different level to it. It's way out of here. Um, but, but, uh, uh, but see, your gift will solve a problem. Each one of you guys is unique. Each one of you guys is different. And it's your difference that makes you special. There's nobody else made like you. There's nobody else with the same DNA as you. And so you say, God, why was I born? I want to seek after wisdom. I want to seek after understanding. And as you seek after wisdom and understanding, you then um, can, can come up with something that, that will solve a problem. It brings favor. So, so here's the problem with seeking money and wealth. If you seek just money and wealth, you're just one person away from losing everything. Shoot, I knew one guy who was a painting, painter. He made a lot of money painting. He was painting all over the Northwest, doing tons of paints. And one day, he had his business uh, paint in the back, and it was the name of his painting business on there, and a $10 an hour employee was driving his, his, butt, his van back, and he, it was a Friday night, he was supposed to go back and drop off his paints at the paint store to recycle it, but instead, he was thinking, man, I want to go uh, to a movie, and so he took a few cans of paint out of the back, instead of taking it to the paint store and recycling, he threw it in a ditch where the stream was, and it was in Beaver Creek, and so the people looked at, hey, this is contamination of the salmon, even though you know not anything spilled out. They saw the guy's company name on there, and he lost everything and spent time in jail. I know another guy that was accused, he blew it, he's a minister, he blew it uh, 20 <coughs> years ago, had a relationship with a lady he shouldn't have had, came out uh, later on, and, and he lost everything and went to jail. Um, I know another person, you know, uh, crashed. Uh, got, you know, got sued, lost all his money. If you seek after money and you put your heart in money and you put your heart in things, then that's not really where the wealth is, see? But if you, if you took all the money in the United States and you divvied it out equally between all the people, in a couple of years, the wealthy would have it right back. Because, see, the wealthy is it's not about money. It's about the mindset. It's about how you do things. And, see, God in His Word has given you the ability to get wealth, okay? And uh, there's wisdom here that, that people in the world employ that aren't even Christians, that make tons of money, okay? But we need to get a hold of the, the truths of God's Word, employ these things for the gospel. There's gospel entrepreneurs and business people that should be, and just because, um, you know, and, and, and you know, Di Diana Ross came to Andre Crouch, hey, help me with this. Um, a Madonna came and, hey, help me with this. You know, other people, you know, some of the greats, Hey, hey, why? Because a gift that's in him. It was in him. And, and, and his dad, you know, was a worshiper. And he didn't even have to pray, you know. If you worship God, guys, and you get into this worship that Shirley's talking about, and you spend time in your, at your house and go around just worshiping God, I'm going to tell you something. Your life will straighten out. Your kids will straighten out. Things will hap happen because it says, those who set their love upon me, I will deliver him. You're not looking to your own strength. When your strength is limited and you come to the end of your resources, that's when God kicks in and He does mighty, mighty, mighty things. I know we serve a God that He could sit here and wipe out the debt, of the, uh, the nation debt in America. He could wipe out. We serve a God of the supernatural. And I want to I want to give you guys a couple of scriptures here um, tonight. I know that, um, uh, so we see here that, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty he might become rich. You know my friends who had that, that, that free tank of gas for over a year and a half? They weren't too smart. One day, um, he got a pay raise and all this, and so they decided to fill it up. And after that, they never got the free gas. <laughs> I'm telling you, when God does something like that, he keeps doing it. Go with it. Yes. Don't, don't have your own <laughs> equation. <place. laughs> don't don't yes. have your own yes. I want to take it a few road trips to the beater, you know? 
<laughs> or change the tires and the oil. Huh? Yeah. So, so don't get don't get your own thing involved. And when God's asked me to do stuff, very seldom has there ever been money. But it's never stopped me from doing what He asked me to do. You know. And um, God is a oh, God is an amazing God. So the greatest thing that you can get, the greatest thing that you can get, is wisdom. I'm going to turn um, to Proverbs. Um, see, let me let me share this with you. It says in the Bible, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you have your head down and think because of your past, the things that you've done that you don't deserve to walk in abundance in the things of God, you're not going to walk in an abundance. But you know what? That's going to be an insult to God. Because he's saying, listen, I shed my blood, son, daughter, so that you don't have a past and that you can be free. If I'm not looking back at your past, why are you looking back at it? You see what I mean? It, it's, it, if you think in your heart, I deserve to be poor, I'll never make it, I can't do that, I can't afford that. Wealthy people don't spend, don't, they don't think like that. <laughs> saved or unsaved, they don't think like that. I know, there's, a, there's an eccentric billionaire in Australia. You know what the difference between rich people and poor people are? One of the differences is what they spend their money on. Mm. You know, rich people will spend their, their way out of debt. They'll buy things out of debt. They'll use their money or other people's money. They'll get real estate deals. They'll get. They'll put their stuff in. They'll. They'll. Uh, they'll buy things and get investments. You know, there's this multi. He was like worth over a billion dollars in Australia. The man only had one pair of shoes. Oh. <laughs> and they asked him, "Why do you only have one pair of shoes?" He goes, "I only have one pair of feet. I can only wear one pair at one time." Makes good sense, I guess. But you know, the lady down the street, she's probably got 15 pairs of shoes. You know, some guy, you know. So, uh, you know, what are, what are you spending your money on? What are you buying? You know, and, and this idea of living without without your means. You have in your possession right now, every individual has in their possession right here, right now, you have the money, the talent, and the ability to be successful and be blessed. Every one of you. Don't think that, that somebody over here is different because, oh, they've got this, this, that. No. You have the ability. Don't ever say, I can't afford this. Say, how can I do this? Okay. If God wants you to do that, just because you set your desire on something doesn't mean that that's the best thing for you, though, either. You know. So I want to show you something here in, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, Robert. yeah, I was going to, um, <laughs> let's see. Well, let's let's turn to Second Chronicles real real fast. I want to show you something. Second Chronicles one eleven. See, I've gone to I've hung out with rich people and gone to these seminars, you know, where they're very very wealthy. And one side of that is this: is that if you're a worldly person and you don't have Christ, you go to one of these seminars and you see how to make money and, and, and what to do on, on on just wisdom. And it can be. From a Christian perspective or a non-Christian perspective, wisdom is wisdom. You know, and it'll work for you. But what happens is sometimes that you become discontent. That's the downside of things. God is saying, hey guys, I want the church to be victorious. I want you to do the best that you can with the, the, the things that I've given you. I want you to be blessed. I want your needs to be met. I want you to be so abundant you're meeting other people's needs. But I also don't want you to rely on your own strength. I want you to rely on me. And, and the, the downside of, I want you guys to get out of this mindset of, of, of limitedness. Don't ever, my goal to the guys coming in the men's home, every one of them, we're going to get you out of debt, out of poverty, off the welfare, <coughs> off this cheese line, out of that thing. But some people become comfortable in that. And, and they're limited, and they walk in fear, and limit, and li limit. And they trust more in the government than they do in God. Oh man, cursed is the man who trusts in the government or a man and not in God. Cursed is the man who does not trust in God. There might come a day where these checks run out, and then you better know your God. You don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't have a uh, working relationship with Him. You are not going to survive when your little you know check comes in of welfare. I know one meeting. I think it was Dave Roberson. One of these prophets were in here, here in a meeting. And it, I mean, he kept on having a word of knowledge. Hey, there's a guy here with a deaf ear. There's this with a deaf ear. And, 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 and I don't know if it was Dave or somebody else. But anyways, he got real descriptive. And then he got down to the detail. Okay, when you were this age, you had this deaf ear, da 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 And everybody thought this, that the, the pre preacher missed it. Like he was just making up this word of knowledge, right? And I thought, my God, you know? <coughs> you know, that was so detailed, you would have thought he was there. Well, after the service... 
This guy comes up and he said, yeah, I had the deaf ear, but I didn't want to be prayed for because I get Social Security for it. No, no. Listen, you know, I wanted to read his arm off and beat the shit with it. But see, I get in trouble for saying things like that because they say Pastor Barry's violent. He threatened to rip somebody's arm off and beat him down the streets. So I got to be careful when I say it, when I talk like that. People come up with things. So, um, you know, if if God if God sits there and um, if He's going to heal the man of a deaf ear. Don't you think that he could provide for him? I mean, that's just a thought. I, yeah. don't, know. Uh, I don't know. Um, but I'm telling you the mentality that we deal with sometimes. So sometimes people leave the men's home because they, they want to be, I've worked so hard to get on this welfare, and now you're telling me to get off of it? Yes. I'm telling you to get a job, yeah. a J-O-B. Yeah, it's called a job. Yeah. The Bible yeah. says that if you don't work, you're worse than an unbeliever. Yeah. The Bible says, let him who steals, steal no more, but let him work with his hands. Amen. That's why I was telling Lonnie. Yeah. Lonnie's like, I'm a car salesman. I'm like, well, let's go out and plant some plants. Well, you know, I don't have any work clothes. Well, I got something you can borrow. You know, we're going to do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> let's do it right now. Run in your mouth and work these. Let's get some calluses on your hands. I'm not saying that Lonnie was stealing. I'm not saying that he was, you know. But it's like, let's work. So he says, let him who steal, steal no more, but let him work with his hands to give to those who have need. Right? That's Amen. a scripture Bible. So we're not chasing after money because money can take wings and fly away. But if you have the gift of God in you, it creates favor, and then that creates finances. Look at when the king of, of the, the, this, what, where was it? He saw the writing on his wall. And he said, go get the prophet. And the prophet told him, you've been waiting the balance and found one. Your kingdom is divided and it can't stand. That created favor because of the gift of God in that man. Okay? The world desperately needs the gifts of God. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. They desperately need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Desperately. And you guys have them in you. Now let's look at 2 Chronicles, Chronicles 1, 1, 11. Um, I want you to see tonight... Um, I want you to see something here. It says uh, 2 Chronicles 1, oh, verse, verses 11. Praise the Lord. This is different for me tonight because I wasn't planning on doing a sermon about money. I wanted to do something about Easter. I had some really good things about Jesus. but I, Well, and this is good about Jesus too. But I mean, though, I think the Lord is dealing with some... You know what? I've been really going through it, honestly, financially. It's a miracle that I'm even um, able to pay um, my bills and everything. It's just been a, a, a season of, of a lot of fights. And the Lord told me a couple months ago, He goes, you're going to go through some real warfare. And He goes, but just keep your eyes on me because, because you're going to make it through it, you know. And there's been like one thing after another. I tell all these attorneys, just get a line. It's like the DMV. You've got to take a number to sue me, okay, because there's too many people suing me, so you're going to have to wait your turn. But, um, <laughs> but God is able to get through all this. I'm not worried about it because God told me about it all ahead of time. And he said, don't stress out about it. Watch what I can do. And the Lord also told me, he says, people don't trust me concerning money. And he goes, I'm going to do some miracles for you. And he goes, they're going to be as great as, as miracles where eyes are open, ears are open, limbs are growing off. You guys remember the guy Ronald Coyne? He got healed by, wasn't it Teal Osborne's sister that prayed for him at a tent meeting? Ronald Coyne. Pastor Dave came up and taped his eye off. Teddy knew him. Teddy asked Teddy Bolden about him. But they had taped his eye off. He had one good eye and one bad eye to where his eye was blown out. He didn't have any eye but just flesh. It was just blood vessels all. There was no eye. So he says, I can see, I can see, in the tent meeting. And so they're like, okay, but you don't have an eyeball. But God used his spiritual eye to see in the natural. So they taped off this good one, and he was reading this person's license, and it tripped them out. It freaked them out. So Ripley's, believe it or not, picked it up, but they let it go because it even freaked them out too much. They couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I was talking to Dave Roberts, and I said, what, go, what, you know, what was going on with that, you know, and whatnot? Well, you know, he was mentioning about God used his spiritual eye to see into the natural realm. Because you're made of body, soul, and spirit. You've got spiritual eyes, spiritual ears. You're going you know, to live on. So it was just a miracle, and I don't know what that has to do with. I had to do something with this, but the Holy Ghost knows. Maybe somebody needed to hear that for some reason. Let's get on to uh, uh, 2 Chronicles 1, verse 11. It says, Then God said to Solomon, Because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for riches or wealth or honor or life of your, or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but you have asked for wisdom and knowledge, 
for yourself, that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. <clears throat> okay, so Solomon asked God for wisdom, and God was so pleased with that that he gave him riches and honor. Okay, now if you want to know how to make money, read Proverbs. You'll get wealthy by reading Proverbs because it, you're talking about the richest man that ever lived is sitting down and writing things. And business people use stuff out of Proverbs all the time. Worldly cats. They use it, man. Now, it's a greater wisdom to know Christ because without Christ, you know, you're messed up. You know, you, you're, you're, you know, it doesn't matter how much. If you gain the whole world, lose your soul. It doesn't profit you anything. But God wants us to get into a place where we as believers are not sitting on the bench and we, we're not saying, oh, you know what, I don't want to win the Grammys with my voice. I just need to be a, a humble you know, Christian. I don't want to show off. No, don't be full of pride and don't do it full of showing off. But if you're like Andre Crouch and you got the gift, go for it, man. Get the Grammy Award. Show the world, man. When he's up there, he's talking about Jesus. He's singing songs about Jesus. He's testifying of Jesus, man, with the right heart. You can do it and you should do it. Don't hold back and say, well, I, you know, I just want to be, you know, a, a hum you know what? I'm going to tell you something. Devil fights a lot of money because a lot of money, a lot of people is a lot of influence. When Benny Hinn comes to town and does a crusade, there's a lot of people. And that really gets people's cackles up in the world. Why? Because that's a lot of influence. Truth is not a persuader. Repetition is a persuader. Let me tell you this. You guys will be changed, and you'll be persuaded. When you start to meditate on the Word day and night, you start to confess the Scriptures about who you are in Christ, your identity and your victory. You start to meditate the Scriptures about Christ alive in you. That will persuade you. That's the persuader. Because if you hear a lie loud enough and long enough, you're going to believe the lie. If you emotionally have thought something about yourself that's not true, and the devil has pounded you and pounded you and pounded you, and for years you thought you couldn't add up, that you couldn't amount to anything, that you can't reach this, you can't attain this, that's for somebody else, that's not for me, then that's exactly what you're going to live in is failure. But if you get a hold of it, and you say, God, now, now I want to show you a couple of scriptures before, before I, um, I close this out. I can't get to everything. I wanted to get to Joshua 1 and some other things. Um, but um, I want to just show you a couple of things out of Proverbs here. Um, God gives you the power to get well. He gives you the power to get well. Let's, um, let's turn to Proverbs. Um, well, let's just start at Proverbs uh, 2, verse 2. So that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Okay? It says, incline your ear to wisdom. My son, if you receive my words and my treasure, my commands within you, so you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding. Do you guys cry out for discernment in the morning? Lord, give me discernment. Give me understanding. Give me understanding for being a father. Give me understanding for business. Jesus, you're my business partner. You're the best businessman that ever walked the face of the earth. Show me the secrets and how to be more effective, how I can do more. I'm going to tell you something. I do it. And when you do it, he'll start to show you stuff that you've never dreamed of. I was in a business meeting, and there was a bunch of attorneys there. So one of them was like $600. And God just told me, gave me all the information on how to circumvent all their craftiness in one shot. And they were speechless. And I was speechless as the fact that that much wisdom came out of my mouth. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, get, don't, get, don't get pride in your heart. You know what I mean? Understand that it's from God. You know, it's like that that was smarter than, than Barry. You know, you know? <laughs> I was like, okay, I can sit down and take notes outside of this. <laughs> so, so you got you got you got more opportunity than other people in the world. You got the Holy Ghost and God Himself living inside you. Why are you utilizing it? So um Let's go to 2 verse 6. It says, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. Wow, that's powerful. Um, a 3 uh, verses 13. Um, Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Look at 16. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. So if you guys want riches and honor and length of days, it's in wisdom, it's in understanding. Instead of saying, God, I want money, say, God, I want you. God, I, I want, I want to find out why I was born. 
How did you make me special? What gifts did you put in me where I can understand science more and computers and know more about this? How I can create something that never... You know George Washington Carver, a black man around the turn of the century, he looked up, I think, at the stars and said, God, show me about the stars. He goes, that's too much for you. He goes, what? He said something like that. And then he said, show me about this. And he goes, that's too much for you. And then God said, why don't you ask about the peanut? You know? He's like, yeah, show me about the peanut. George Washington Carver was one of the most amazing scientists. He came up with paint. He's the one that invented paint. He invented peanut butter. He invented like 300 products right out of the peanut. Right out of the peanut. And God gave him all this. God gave him all of it. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. He had a relationship with God. And God gave him something. Now the whole world is benefiting from the things that he had done. Okay? The sinner, the believers and unbelievers. But I'm telling you that, that there's a place that we can get to. We, got, we can't be thinking so low. You know, well, I have a heart to do this thing, but I don't know how to get there. Well, there's a class in college on it. Why don't you go down and take it? And then take more. You know what? You've got a good education, not if you've learned a lot of details about something. Let me tell you what a good education is. is a person who's seeking more. He's seeking deeper to learn more. That's a good education. It's somebody that says, God, I want to go deeper in you. I want to know more. I want to do more. Okay, 319. I know that uh, you guys are, are, are bearing with me. And, and um, I want you guys to, I don't want to lose out on some of these scriptures here in wisdom. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By wisdom. There's earthly wisdom and there's heavenly wisdom. So length of days are in our right hand, riches and honor. Uh, verse five, 4, verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Hear, my son, and receive the saints, and the years of your life will be many. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. When you walk, your steps will be will not be hindered, and when you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let her go. Keep her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of the, the evil. Avoid it. Do not travel in its path. You know. Anyways, uh, uh, 4 verse 7. You got uh, uh, verse uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 4. Listen to this. Um, say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest relative, your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman. That's interesting. You see guys going with wrong women and whacked out women. A lot of guys come to the, the men's home. You know, 50% of them in rough situations have been in, with wrong relationships. It says that wisdom herself will keep you from bad women. It calls wisdom a her. So if you want to ask a woman about a good woman, she's going to know more about women than a man's going to know about women. So ask wisdom. Look to wisdom. It'll point you in the right direction. Women know these things. They know the good from the bad. They can pick it up easier than, than men. But it says it's going to keep you from an immoral woman. Amen? Amen. And from the seductors who flatters with their words. For out of the corner of my house I looked, and through my lattice I saw among the simple. I perceived among the youth a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street. We see a lot of those young men devoid of understanding these days. Not many. They're led more by the TV than the Word of God. And so, um, but, but tonight... Um, I, wanna, I want you guys to understand, um, you know, how many goals have you written down? What are the desires that God has put in your heart? What, is, what are the things um, that have held you back in wrong believing? I, I, there was a couple brothers here who were saying, well, you know what, I have a real problem with this message that Sherby's bringing about, about the wealth. And I said, well, that's just because that you haven't heard, you know, this truth. But if you really look into the Word of God, you'll find out that it's there. Moses was a wealthy man. Jesus was a wealthy man. Jesus had a treasure. Zacchaeus was a wealthy man. These people were not poor. They were not poor. But you know what? Jesus in his wealth, though, he did not rely on money. He didn't look to money. God was not his money. He says, you're going to serve God or man, and you'll be loyal to one and serve the other. David Hogan was given a million dollars in his ministry. And he says, we're set. I was sent to Mexico for all these years and been, you know, poor and we've eked it out and all our ministries are, are really scraping by. But Mrs. Hogan, we are set. We've got a million dollars. We can finally get that retirement. We're going for it. And uh, Mrs. Hogan came back from prayer and said, you're going to give it all away. It's not a fat chance I am. He go, and uh, she goes, no, you're going to give it all away. And he goes, why? And uh, she goes, God told me. And Mr. Hogan was like, God didn't tell me that. And so then he went to praying and fasting and he came back and he said, you're right. 
Within a week, they had it all given away. Money didn't hold him. He's not, he's not controlled by money. It's not holding on to him. If you talk to guys like T.L. Osborne, they had houses all over the world. But whenever they talked to money, they were talking about souls, souls, souls. Reinhard Bonnke was sitting in the middle of Africa crying one day. He needed 50 bucks when he first started out his ministry to pay for some offices. And at that time, 50 bucks might have been 50 million bucks. Nobody had it. Nobody knew had it. And it was a lot of money 40 years ago to pay the rent on the buildings for his ministry. And he stood in the street crying and said, God, God said to him, what would you do if I gave you a million dollars? And he says, God, I don't want to be a millionaire. I want to be a soul millionaire. And today he's won 100 million people to Jesus. Okay, that is going to be a star that's going to shine brightly. It says, those who lead many from darkness to light will shine brightly in the resurrection. But I will tell you this, there's men and women of God who've given great finances to Brother Reinhard Bonnke. When Reinhard Bonnke needed it, um, there are some wealthy people of America that sent the money. But he didn't say, oh, this is from Americans or this is from this person. This is from God. God is helping us do it. See, if you're disobedient, if you don't produce what God has called you to produce, if you're lazy, if you're not diligent, if you're wasteful with your money, if God gives you money and you don't invest it right, or you don't do with what he says for you to do it, it affects the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. If you're lazy and you're fearful and you're limited in what you're doing in obedience to God, even things like giving your driver's license, it affects the kingdom of God. Because now you can't pick people up for church. And you should have been the bus driver. Okay? you got to get... Take what's in your hands. Take what God's given you. Be a diligent steward with it. Get wisdom and increase, increase, increase where you're at. Give more. Say, God, I want to give more. I want to do more. I, I want to be more. I, I want to reach out. And I want to, I want to, and I'm not saying this tonight so that way you're not content with where you're at. Because the Bible says with godliness, with contentment, it's great gain. It's better to be a man that does not have finances but has Jesus. <coughs> But don't use that as an excuse to be poor when God's given you a business mind. He's given you the ability to get wealth for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and for your family. Well, I don't want to go take that class at college even though I can double my income because I'm comfortable at my work. Go home and tell your wife that. She's not going to really be so glad about that. But what I'm saying is stretch yourself. Don't settle. Don't spend outside of your means. Live within your budget. Don't do the credit card things. If you make $300 a week, learn to live on $300 a week. If you don't have any money to invest, then get other people's money to invest. The greatest money that I ever made, I made $500,000 one year, and I didn't have a dime to my name. And I went and I bought this property. I locked it up. I went and I told the realtor, I want to write, write up this offer on this, this deal for a million dollars or whatever. He's like, well, what do you have for a down payment? Nothing, but I'll be back. But you know what I did? I told the realtor, look, wouldn't you like to make 500 grand? He goes, yeah. I said, I'll tell you what. You get my offer into these um, sellers before the other people that you're presenting, or, or at least show it, because I knew the other people were presenting cash. It was a doctor, a lawyer, and somebody else that was wanting to buy the property. It was an estate, and they wanted to buy it at a discount. But they were going to give money. I knew that realtor was looking after his commission, and he may not even present my deal. So I said, you present my deal, and I'll make your partner. And you know what? He did. He made 500000 But the thing is, is I knew if you got such a good deal, such a good investment, it didn't matter if you had money or not. As long as I can tie it up, I can get another guy to fund it because of the fact of all the money he'll make. Right? So I locked up the deal, and then I went and got somebody to fund it. I said, oh, I'm poor. I can't do that. No, forget that. I can make millions. I can turn around tomorrow and make millions. I can lose millions. That's not the point. The point is, you've got to think. You've got to change your thinking. You've got to change your mind. You've got to say, God, what do I have in my resources? What can I do? And you've got to know that God wants you to be blessed. We did a lot of things with that. I mean, with that money, we started a women's home. You know, but what if I would have said, oh, you know what? I can't do this. I can't. And I'm not saying that God won't use other people, not always your own. I'm saying this, guys, look up. Quit thinking about poverty. Quit thinking Amen. about limitless. Quit getting your eyes on. I'm going to tell you the currency of heaven is not money. It's faith. That's the currency of heaven. If you want to see things happen, faith is substance. Faith will bring things into the realm. But I'm going to tell you this right now. You won't ever get anything that you can't see. If you can't see somebody coming out of a wheelchair, you're never going to see them coming out. You're never going to pray for somebody to see them come out of a wheelchair. 
If you can't look into God's Word and see yourself as somebody that's prosperous and not on welfare, and that you're lending to other people and giving to other people, and that you're pulling people out of things, and you're breaking poverty off, you'll never be there. If you can't see yourself the way God sees you, and the way He said about it, as a man thinking in his heart, so is he. I know some, some brother in a certain religion that said, well, we want to be poor, and we want to be humble, so we're going to get rid of all the seats out of this place, and so they made people sit on the, on the floor in another country. And they were doing a great work for the Lord, but they had this messed up idea about poverty, that it's good to be poor, and this and all that. No, that's a curse from hell. That's a lie from the devil. God wants you to be abundant. He wants provision for every good work. But He doesn't want your eyes to be on money and seeking after money. He wants you to seek after Him. But if you've been called to give to the Lord, forgive this 10% to the Lord. Try 90 or 95% of your income. R.G. Laternal, read the book. Mover of men and mountains. He was born. He funded most of the missionary work in the 70s. He's got a great amount of souls to his behalf based on his business expertise. He gave away 90% of his income, lived on 10%. That's in some of you. Okay, but we didn't hear him as a great evangelist in the 70s. We heard about T.L. Osborne and all these other guys. Well, who do you think funded him? Who do you think is more dangerous to the devil, the guy preaching or the guy funding it? Who do you think you have to lift up in prayer as much as preachers, your Christian businessmen? Because God wants to increase you, increase your influence, and the devil wants to take you out. Most of the people that start giving a lot to the Lord in the early days, when they start making big money, start tapering it off. And they're living. they got five vacation homes, and they're not doing it like they should be, see? I'm not saying it's wrong to have a vacation home. I'm saying be obedient to God. Be sold out for Jesus. Buy the truth and don't sell it. Get in the vein. Get this thing that Sherby's ministering on on this on this. Uh, on this uh, prosperity and, and abundance. I want you to get it into your spirit. Get it into your soul. Don't be limited. If you don't have a license, get a license. Quit sitting back. Quit being lazy. Quit li laying around. You know the devil's workers are doing more than you're doing. The Muslims probably pray most of the most Christians. They, they get their mat out three times a day and pray at least. <laughs> Whatever. <Yeah. laughs> They're not doing anything. <laughs> You ask him, why are you praying? I don't know. Has God ever answered any one of your prayers? No. Why are you praying? Because we're supposed to. Well, that's the lamest thing I ever heard. You know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So I want you to get this thing from a practical perspective tonight, from the Word. Get it in you. Get a hold of wisdom and understanding. Get it in you. Okay? Don't be uh, feeling um, down on yourself if, if you're working at McDonald's or you're doing this. Listen, that's a whole lot more better than living on some kind of a welfare check. Yeah. You can hold right. your head up high. But I'm going to tell you something. In Christianity, you've got the perseverance and the faith to go, Lord, I can put up with this job. I'm okay here. Or you can say, God, I'm believing for a better job. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be faithful here, but I'm believing for a better job. I'm just telling you, you have a responsibility, your family and the kingdom of God, to do the best that you can with the resources that God's given you. You know, I know people that are from here that have gone, to, been homeless, devastated, and now they've started churches. I know people from that have come through um, in his care and now are, are, are doing well. And they were homeless, living in the car, totally destroyed, and they're making good money now. Prosperous, given into the church, planted in church. And a few churches in the community, uh, elders and ushers, you know, called to go there. And so, you know, um, but these are people that praise God. They didn't whine about where they were. They worshiped God. They got a thankful heart. And they said, you know what? We can do it. We can do it. Have eyes to see I mean, I think that, you know, there's people in here tonight, in fact, I know that there's some people in here that tonight that have some millionaire ideas. They do. And you've got to say, Lord, let me get into that. Let me, let me, you know, walk it out. Let me, you know. The difference between people that are poor and the people that are rich is how they spend their money. The rich people spend money on stuff that's going to make them money, and the poor people buy a thousand shoes. You know, <laughs> this guy's buying businesses with other people's money. Well, I don't know how to do that. Then read a book on it. Well, I can do that. Yes, you can. Hey, man, some of the greatest compliment you can give a guy that's successful is take him out to lunch and say, let me buy you lunch. Give me, let me give you $100, my last $100 that I have this week, to take you out to lunch and ask you some questions. He might even take you under his wing and show you everything he knows about, about that industry. And then pretty soon you'll be, you know, one of the guys that sure be won to the Lord that was a funky guy, homeless, not living on a bridge, and you can smell him for blocks around. One of the businessmen of the church gave him a shower, and now he's the vice president of the bank. Winning souls, doing, you know, 
I'm just saying I want to rip apart this poverty mentality and I want to rip apart this mentality that says that we got to chase money or that in, in the, the body of Christ that if, if, you're, if you're doing what you should be for God, then you should have money. It's not about how much it's in your bank account. It's about what's inside of you. If you're taken to China and they rip all your money away and they're persecuting you for the gospel, are you going to be able to stand up to that pressure for years, being beaten with batons and electric shockers and having them, having them beat you to half to death? Are you going to stand up? Is what's inside you wealthy? Or are you going to stand up if you have a million bucks in your hand and you wind up with two or three million? Are you going to still come to church? Because I can tell you this, that some people that have been diligent under poverty, when they've been blessed, they have fallen away. And right where God warns about, hey, I'm giving you the power to get wealth, he warns about that in that same chapter. Yeah. Always look at the negative side of things, to, uh, to get wisdom, to understand what to watch out for. Always look at both sides of things. You've got to have wisdom. So, Lord, I just pray right now. Lord, I know tonight, Lord, wasn't much of a... A, a traditional Easter message, but I know, God, that you put it on my heart to drop some nuggets. And, Lord, I believe that they're going to have eternal consequences. They're going to, there's going to be some supernatural things happening in the areas of money for people to step out of here, Lord. And, God, I just pray right now, Lord, for your hand, Lord, on each and every one of the minds and hearts that are here tonight. Lord, burst something within them. Lord, let some wheels turn. I pray, Father God, for some shackles, God, to break off minds and hearts tonight of people who are limiting themselves. They were limiting what you can do. They weren't, Father God, um, 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 reaching out and believing and praying. I pray, Father God, that you would turn the keys in our heart and in lives and minds tonight. Lord, we don't seek after money. We seek after you, Jesus. But Lord, I pray, Father God, for those giftings and those talents. I pray tonight for wealth and riches to establish your covenant on the earth. I pray, God, for the riches, Lord, of heaven. Lord, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit. I also ask, God, that you would, Lord, pour out wisdom and understanding and discernment on us. Lord, there's giftings in this room. There's talents in this room. Lord, right now, Father God, I, I pray, God, that, that, um, uh, Lord, that, Lord, you would speak to people right now in their hearts about ideas and things that you've prompted them to do and they've put it on the shelf, they've been complacent. Lord, tonight I believe uh, you're speaking prophetically uh, to get people to stop sitting around, stop sitting, sitting on the bench, waiting, Lord, waiting on God, but, but to go and do it. So Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord, right now for vision, for eyes to be opened. Speak to people tonight, even tonight, even this night. Speak to them in the area of wealth and finances. And they're part in the body of Christ. And how can they can impact the body of Christ in a greater way? Lord, we want to use the gifts of the Spirit. And we want to use our wealth, Lord Jesus, to build your kingdom, to build your covenant for souls and for eternity. So, Lord, help us to do that. Show us how to do it. I pray, God, that not one person, God, would be a lover of money, but they would be a lover of you. Lord, you didn't say money was the root of all evil. You said the love of money. Lord, I pray for money. I pray, God, that you would bless these folks. I pray that you would meet every need. But Lord, let us never take our eyes off you, Jesus. Let us never look to, to the money. Lord, there's a, there's a perverse um, a doctrine being preached in America today, both that, that it's holy to be poor, it's good to be poor, and Lord, that, 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 uh, that money, Lord, is somehow makes you righteous. And that's void of all understanding or truth. God, you are. You are our wealth, and you are our source. And I pray right now, God that you would open our eyes and our ears in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that the shackles and the minds and hearts would come off. And, Lord, you would turn some keys, Lord, in some hearts and lives. Lord, there's so much more that I want to teach on this. But, God, I pray, Lord, that tonight, Lord, those things that have been said, Father, they would go into the hearts of people. And, Lord, that they would understand, God, that you paid a heavy price and took all poverty so that we would have provision and our needs would be met. And that you haven't called us to be broke. But you've called us to walk into abundance and to, and to give to every good work. And so, Lord, I call that forth right now. And, Lord, I pray, Lord, with the money that we have right now, with the limited resources that we have, that we'd be diligent and be faithful, that when we're faithful with that, God, that you would increase it on us, Lord. For truly, if we're not faithful with the little things, we cannot be entrusted with more. So help us to be diligent. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be obedient, O oh God, to what you've asked each and every one of us to do in this place. To build your kingdom in this place. And I declare the work and the lie of Satan coming down concerning money in Clark County. Satan, I'm telling you right now, I'm coming after you. I tear your mindset down, your kingdom down, the fairy tales, the fables, the lies that you've spoken yes. to the people of God. I break your power yes. by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I declare the wealth, and I declare the riches, and the, and the riches of heaven, and the inheritance of God, and the truth of God's 
God's word to come down and set the minds and hearts free in this place. And Lord, let, Father God, the fruit of it show in the natural. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.